Okay, guys, uh, let's get started with this lecture. Second to last week. How exciting, how exciting is that? I'm really excited about that. Um, maybe as we are heading towards the end, I'm not entirely sure what we're going to do next week. There's definitely going to be a review session in the last lecture. So the last lecture will be a review session. And then probably on Tuesday, I will take some time to also talk about the assignment, right, so that you guys actually get some feedback on that as well. I'm going through this at the moment, but, you know, it's actually an awful amount of work to read all that kind of stuff. Uh, but still, hopefully, you know, I don't know, um, uh, probably I won't be done with it by Thursday, but it will be done by Tuesday for sure. So mm -hmm. you will have some opportunities to talk with me about what you can do better for the exam at the end of the day. Right? or if you've done well, so that you know where you are. So, but in the very last lecture, there will be a review session. I will talk a little more about the exam as well, because let's face it, at the end of the day, there's also going to be an exam for this, yeah? and I don't know, we all want you to do well on this. Okay, so let's get started with the topic. Uh, this week, we will talk about social networks. Social networks, and you know, I start a little more generally with that, Maybe now you see how this is fitting together in this lecture series, you know, where we are, we want to explain macro-level phenomena, and we think about how, I don't know, individual action brings that about, you know, how things are being generated, and then very quickly we started talking about interactions between people, right? And we've dealt with interactions of people an awful amount of time already, yeah? Talked about social influence, we talked about, you know, people changing the neighborhood of others, which then change the situation, the social context for other people, and so on. So in fact, we implicitly dealt with social networks already. We just didn't, didn't name it like that, right? And so now we're kind of jumping a little more into that. And as it actually, in fact, this is, this is my field of research. So all I do, I publish and I write, I don't know, I do research in, in this field on social network analysis. And today I'll also present, give you some examples about my own research. Probably next week I'll talk a little more about that as well. I have another paper that I might kind of, as an excursion for you, where you see how it all comes together and so on. But social networks, there's actually a reason why social networks are so, I don't know, important in that. Well, I think they're cool anyway to study, and lots of people jump onto studying social networks because they are cool, you know. Um, as a student, I also did that, you know. I, I thought, oh, do I really want to study social class? Yeah. Did I tell you the story? Actually, I did for my master's. I studied social class and uh, eating and drinking behavior, social stratification. I did very serious sociological research. I hope I still do very serious research. But I was at this very traditional UK place where people did study social mobility for the last 70 years. So I did my PhD at Nuffield College. And Nuffield College is uh, just the place in the UK where people did quantitative social science research looking at social class and social stratification and social mobility, right? So this is sort of where, I don't know, where this research that just happened. And I started off my research being a little bit of a renegade already and then kind of thinking to, to combine social class with what people eat and drink. So I was interested in are there class differences in, uh, in how, what people eat, you know, and, and I don't know, the kind of drinks that they have. And, uh, and whether these class differences changed over time. But uh, to be honest, I was getting a little bored by that, but then also I realized I'm using something like social class, which is huge, to explain something whether people eat salad or mashed potatoes. And I realized that's sort of like a little disconnected, you know? I, have, I take a huge concept, social class, to explain a micro-level behavior. I don't know why. And that sort of made me realize, hang on, I don't know, what are we actually doing? Yeah? And where's the value added of the sociologist? And because I think, I don't know, other people, other disciplines, economists, psychologists, social psychologists, I don't know, business folks, are much better at explaining individual level behavior. That's not where our strength is. Yeah? I think our strength, and it sort of like became this realization for me, is actually when we combine these two levels with each other. You know, when we either kind of go down from the macro to the micro, or when we actually go up from the micro to the macro again. Right. At the time, I didn't know it was analytical sociology. As it turns out, this is analytical sociology, and that's at the very core of it. This is why I'm doing it. But anyway, so then I actually changed my topics, and I started to study um, the interaction patterns of English Premier League football teams. So I looked at um, a lot of data. I looked at football players and how they pass the ball to whom, 
and I did a very serious statistical analysis about that, about which kind of patterns leads to better performance. So how would you have to organize your team? Which interaction pattern would you have in order to be successful in the team? So there was actually a time in my life where I was just switching from the one, from the one project to the other where I could credibly sit in a pub and have a pint and watch a Premier League football match and pretend to be working at two projects at the same time. <laughs> but anyway, so I started doing social network analysis. So let's get started with that. So what I brought with me for today is, first of all, a little, little detour, but you know, I already talked about that, about interdependencies, how they matter. Then we talk about embeddedness, Mark Granovetter. Also, he comes back with the strength of the ties, and let's see if we get to the last one or not. So interdependencies. Now, again, you know, like networks are very interesting. Regardless, you know, people do that. It's absolutely legitimate. You know, they're kind of cool. Uh, they map the real world. We see it in the real world. But there's also an epistemological reason why I think we should study social networks. Now, this is coming back to one of the very first illustrations that I had about, you know, there's the social world. We take it apart. We want to understand how things work. Yeah? We want to dissect it. Actually, Peter Hesterham, the, the founding father of analytic sociology, he called it dissecting the social. Yeah, taking, taking things apart. Yeah. And then, you know, we can look at how things go, but we still don't really know why they turn. We still don't know what is going on. We can see how things change, but we still don't know. So we actually need to really think about how things are connected with each other, how they are being brought about. Yeah. That's sort of like this whole idea of the generative process. We have like macro-level phenomena. We need to think about how they come about. Think about this whole example of segregation. We see it. Just by seeing it, we, we have no idea actually what is driving it. Yeah. I showed you that there could be completely different levels of discrimination that drive segregation, the same levels of segregation at the end of the day. So we need to think about how things are connected with each other and how they go, you know, and also which direction they are connected. And now the next step, and now, I don't know, when we think about all these different things, how they are arranged and how they go together, uh, John Elster, he, in his book, Nuts and Bolts, he has like this formulation, the cocks and wheels, you know, like how things come together and then how society works. The whole idea of a mechanism lends itself to that idea, how do things are arranged, you know, how they come together. And then you realize, actually, we need to think about how these things are arranged, right? And how they all come together. And now, <laughs> maybe, maybe now we are there because the things that are arranged in a, in a fundamental way that we deal with a lot in our daily life are people. We are sort of like connected with each other. And then you see, so in order to make an explanation, then very quickly we are at social networks. So this is now, well, a little detour, but you know, why not? Uh, why there's a fair epistemological reason for that. So I think this is our Coleman's boat. James Coleman, you know, is like the principle we had all the time, macro-level phenomena that we want to explain, but we actually go through individuals, right? And actually the thing that in my research that I'm kind of like pushing forward is, uh, actually in all my work, that in order for this Coleman's boat to sail, I think we need to have social networks at the very core of it. Because only then we can make meaningful sense of how the macro and the micro are connected with each other. Anyway, so again, this is sort of like a little detour about why we should talk about social networks. You know, I don't know, it's about dynamics and... But uh, in essence, social life is inherently dynamic and interdependent, as you hopefully now agree, right, with uh, all the little things that we talked about, broken windows, social influence, success with success, Matthew effect, self-fulfilling prophecies, all these kind of things. It's the same thing, that there are these interdependencies. Huh? It's not that individuals are isolated from each other. And I think this is the strength of sociology coming in, saying that they are not isolated from each other, but in fact they affect each other and that leads to complex patterns or to macro-level outcomes. So social life is inherently dynamic and interdependent, you know, and this is sort of like at the core of analytical sociology. It emphasizes that. Uh, it also says that from this perspective, you know, it is essential to base explanations on social or macro-level outcomes in clear and precise series of individual action and interaction. And interaction, now we are at the point of talking about social networks. And interaction, you know, it matters in many ways. I don't know, it's just, again, it's like an old slide that I had. We see that there are dependencies, meaning that what one person does has an effect on another person. And we see that in relation to adoption of innovation, smoking behavior, divorce, suicide, crime, obesity, many more. Funny story. I have a couple of funny stories. Sometimes I tell stories. 
need to stop me when I kind of tell stories. So um, actually, I was working on a paper with a, with, a, with a PhD student of mine on obesity, yeah, on social networks and obesity. Hopefully, the guy, oh, you know him, Travis. He was here, wasn't he? He was here, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So a little side story, probably he didn't tell you. So we were working on this project on social networks and obesity. And while we worked on this, you know, really hardcore, like really sitting down, really writing the paper. And now we have one paper accepted, great network science. Then the other paper on our social networks, both the two best journals in social network analysis. Uh, nice results that came out of it, but it was an awful amount of work. And during that time, working on obesity, I personally gained five kilos. Yeah. So I said the next project is about sports again, because I actually <laughs> do serious research on sports. Right? So I started some more sports-related work. Anyway, so when we talk about networks and how people are embedded in social life, we need to talk about one guy. We need to talk about Mark Granovetter. And if people, a couple of years, it's kind of funny, I was actually asked by a member of the Nobel Prize Committee who I would suggest for a Nobel Prize. It's kind of really weird, probably, you know, that I was a little student, like, oh, but they just wanted to hear my perspective on things. And uh, we talked about it a little bit, and we talked about Mark Ranovet. And the reason for that is because he had a huge impact on sociology, the whole field of social network analysis. Um, and as it turns out, two of, his, uh, two of his papers, both published in AJS, are amongst the three most cited papers in sociology overall. Like, the single most cited piece of work in sociology is the first paper. It's the Economic Action and Social Structure, the Problem of Embeddedness. It's a bit of a fuzzy paper. It's sometimes weird, you know, but I have a personal theory that sometimes when something is a little fuzzy, a lot of people can connect to it. That kind of makes it relevant for lots of people, in a way. But in this case, we'll talk about that in a second, and then later on we come back to a second paper, The Strength of Weak Ties, which I think is the third most overall cited paper in sociology. And both, both talk about social networks. The first one is a little more abstract, while the second one is actually pretty detailed and specific. <coughs> so he's still there, you know, he's still around. He's this professor in Stanford. Um, uh, and, and he sort of, you know, had a remarkable career. Um, he talked about first what he called embeddedness or social embeddedness. Uh, it's how we are sort of like embedded in the social world. Yeah. And he started that thinking about how does our economic life work? How do we buy things? How do markets work? How do businesses relate with each other? What kind of, how do they operate? Right? So at the essence, it is about economic action. And he kind of realized that in those days, you know, think about that. This was like the 70s where he thought about that, you know. And then he wrote this paper in the 80s. And, and in the 70s, in particular, sociologists, Sociologists were really like thinking really big. Yeah? There were people like Tarko Parsons and so on. Maybe you came across that guy. Uh, um, so I don't know. And, and he was like a huge figure in sociology. Yeah? Uh, but actually, sociologists at the time, they, they put an awful amount of effort on social factors. Yeah? For example, social class. A bit like in my PhD project, there was social class. And that is sort of determines why people eat mashed potatoes. Yeah? Something like that. Not to say that these things don't matter, right? But in a certain degree, sociologists went a little too far onto the one side. So the, the, the overly focused on social factors, and that led them to stress their, this priority of it, or of that socialized, or socializing motives of human behavior. So the idea was that we are social beings. We are socialized in a way. You don't even know that. I don't know. You, you're being born in, in a certain part of this world. You were born in an area of Dublin or somewhere else, right? And by just being there, by just having the parents, by just having, having, having them having their parents and them having jobs and so on, you are sort of like exposed to a certain way of thinking. You're exposed to a certain way of dealing with problems. You're sort of exposed to a certain way of what you think about education versus manual labor and things like that, right? So that is like the, like the thought of sociologists. And, uh, um, and Granovetter observes that. And he observes a different kind of conception of man, so to speak. In those days, 70s, they all wrote about man. Yeah? I don't know. It's probably because they were all men. But uh, obviously, I don't know, it should refer uh, to human beings. Yeah? Uh, so, um, and, and he kind of observed, 
he, two different interpretations, conceptions of how human beings behave, yeah, and how we theoretically think about that. On the one side, he, he saw this over-socialized thing, yeah, that we are sort of the product of, of our upbringing, we are sort of the product of our socialization, yeah, and that's sort of driving all our decisions. On the other side, we had like economists, you know, developing their own view of the world about how things work and how economic life goes, but also like how individuals behave, yeah? which is at the other extreme of the rational being, you know, the homo economicus, like everything is being cost benefits, calculated, you know, what do I do? And that kind of determines individual decisions in a way. So these are like two conceptions that Granovetter observed and he pitted them against each other, right? That was like in this paper embeddedness of, I don't know, economic action. So on the one side, you know, it's like a narrow pursuit of self-interest, you know, individuals are all rational and so on. But in that kind of worldview, individuals also don't change the world. You know, they are just reacting to things and the world changes and that kind of changes the cost-benefit structure and then they behave in a different way, right? So that's like this economist view on the world back in the 1970s. Of course, nowadays, I don't know, they adjusted and they, they matured from, from, I don't know, some harsh rational choice uh, approaches as well. But then on the other side, we have this over-socialized idea made popular by this guy, Dennis Wrong, as well, who wrote a paper in the American Sociological Review. If you're interested in that, read the paper by Granovetter. He refers to these other things, right? The key paper is the Granovetter paper. He kind of summarizes the argument of Dennis Wrong as well. And there he says, okay, in this over-socialized world, behavioral patterns are so internalized yeah, that, uh, that everything is the outcome of, of this socialization process. Yeah? So like we are, I don't know, related to people in a way but these relationships don't even matter anymore because they kind of really affect it in the way I think. Yeah. So it's so engraved into my, into my whole body and my thinking uh, that, uh, that these relationships are actually not there anymore. You know, like social influence is an external force that insinuates itself in the minds of bodies of individuals. Social influence is all contained inside an individual's head. Yeah, it's, all, it's all happening there. As there's no direct connection, sort of. And that's sort of what Granovetter criticizes. He says, listen, guys, I don't know, you have the, this economics, economics on the one side, thinking about this hardcore rational choice uh, behavior. The other side, we have those sociologists that think everything is socialized and everything is internalized. Yeah? But both of you guys are kind of miss out the crucial point of having social context and relationships that matter. So that was his contribution. And then, you know, he talks about this, uh, um, I don't know, there's a quote from him saying that actors do not behave or decide as atoms outside the social context, nor do they adhere slavishly to a script written for them. You know, the one side is, I don't know, outside the social context, that would be the, the economist view, and the other one is, nor do they adhere slavishly to a script written for them. That would be the over-socialized man, right? Um, for them, by the particular intersection of social categories that they happen to occupy. Their attempts at purpose of action are instead embedded in concrete ongoing systems of social relations. When you read these things, when you read these things for the first time, I remember when I read these things for the first time, I kind of thought, ah, that's a no-brainer. Isn't that sort of like what we thought about it all the time? Uh, this is like, a, I don't know, a fancy way of saying something, you know, but no, actually no. Because we had before this economist view, you know, it's all about rational action, other individuals behave isolated from each other. On the other side, it's all about social context really socializing me and kind of uh, uh, affecting me in that way. So, so there actually was a contribution to this. You know? And actually this turned to a whole new discipline that was being formed. It's turned to a whole revival of what we nowadays call economic sociology or new economic sociology, it all started with Granovetter uh, and, and, uh, and this paper. So that's uh, his, idea of, um, his idea of embeddedness. Why did it become so popular? Or why do people think, I don't know, where does it actually matter? You know, you know he, he was concerned about economic behavior. He looked at markets and how, I don't know, uh, actually he even studied you know, Chinese business networks uh, uh, and how, how they operate, you know, how, how do they go about what they do, right? And, and here the, the realization was that, you know, this even rational exchanges between rational actors like companies, businesses, corporations, and so on, that in these kind of circumstances, pre-existing social relationships, they matter. You would think and sometimes hope that these things don't matter, 
know, even at the university here, we have roles. I have like shitty roles here at the school. I have to run to this committee, to that committee. Think about that problem and ah, you know, sometimes it's just a nightmare, you know? And you have to deal with so many other people. I have to deal with that administrator. I have to deal with that, I don't know, vice principal. I don't know, with that, I don't know, role somewhere, right? And you would think we all have our roles. We are all rational beings. We are all somewhat intelligent, I hope. And, um, and that then the type of relation that we have shouldn't matter. Uh, it's not how it goes in Ireland. Yeah. You really need to get to know the people and you know, and you're like, hey, hang on, you know, and they know you. And uh, if you go the official route, nothing is going to happen. I have so many emails that kind of disappeared in this void. Yeah. It just got sucked up by this black hole, by this singularity somewhere. Right? So I need to know that person. And you know where I know that person from? From playing football with the guy Friday afternoons. Yeah? So I know him from there. So I have a direct connection to the, I don't know, to the college finance officer who then tells me about, I don't know, these financial things that, I don't know, I should have been able to solve otherwise. But actually, you know, it's actually very difficult. So in, in, in businesses, and that's what Granovet has studied, you know, like even in companies, their relationships with other companies really matter. Yeah, you sometimes, often, oftentimes, it's actually the case that um, you know, let's say you are a big, big company, you produce a new smartphone, or you produce whatever a car, and uh, you don't go necessarily for the cheapest supplier, but you go for the one that you have the long-lasting relationship with, because it might still be rational for you to do that. Yeah? Because you get, I don't know, you know what you get from that other person. You know, you can trust them in delivering on time. You know, I don't know if uh, there's a problem with the contract. They are good to deal with in a way. These kind of things matter. Yeah? And that's sort of where this whole embeddedness idea formed the basis for a new way of thinking about economic life. That's where this new economic sociology uh, was born, which is a whole other different thing. I think we have a lecture about it. I think Paul is having a lecture about that. I gave a lecture about this elsewhere. But here, Paul is giving that lecture. OK, so um, economic exchanges are not carried out between strangers, but rather individuals are involved in long-term relationships. OK, so now here I have the guy himself. So before kind of talking more about that, let's just listen to how Mark Granovetter explains this embeddedness idea. The argument in the paper starts out by saying, uh, suppose people, uh, what, would, what would economic life be like if people didn't have social relationships? And I said, well, that's a thought experiment. And it's a thought experiment that is very hard to, to accomplish because people always do have social relationships. But if you look at the way people have analyzed the economy, they have tended to go in two different directions. Either they have taken what I called the under-socialized approach, which is typical of classical and, and modern economics, which is that people are basically pursuing their own self-interest and their social relationships don't matter. All that matters is what they're doing in the economy. So that's under-socialized. But then there was a sociological view, which is that people's activities in the economy or anywhere else were completely regulated by the norms and values they had, they, they had acquired from, from their socialization, from their childhood, from their people around them. Uh, and that's what Dennis Wrong had called, uh, another sociologist had called, the over-socialized conception of man in modern sociology. And I said in this paper, look, you might think these are opposites. You know, one has people uh, that are completely out for themselves and are, are not paying any attention to anything else. Another has, has people who are completely in the, um, com completely under the control of these norms and values that, that they, they've absorbed from the larger society. But there's a funny sense in which these two extreme views coincide with one another in the sense that they both ignore people's social relationships. And once you take people's social relationships into account, you get a different picture of the economy. Because a lot of what happens in the economy happens through social relationships. People carry out a lot of their economic activities through social relationships. And once you take that into account, and I called that embeddedness, I said that, that people are, um, people's economic activity is embedded in their networks of social relations, and that whether or not people can trust each other, which is a big problem in any economic set of outcomes, uh, depends on what kind of social network and social relationships they have. One thing I didn't say that people often make the mistake of attributing to me or attributing to economic sociology is that people's social relationships always lead them to trust one another. This is a mistake. I mean, whether there is trust is a complicated issue. It depends on how the network of social relationships is set up. 
In fact, it's very important to keep in mind that when you trust other people, you are much more vulnerable than if you didn't. So that the fact that you have a social relationship with someone may make you think that you can trust them and you don't have to pay attention to what they're doing. But if the other person has bad intentions toward you, as sometimes is the case, we talk about the so-called confidence rackets, where people simulate interest in you and simulate social relationships so that they can deceive you. So that when you have a social relationship and when you trust another person, then you're much more vulnerable to them than if they were strangers, because then you would be wary. So it's, it's not an automatic thing that you have trust because you have social networks. But I, it did seem to me that the argument that Williamson made in Markets and Hierarchies f failed because he didn't take into account, he just assumed that everyone interacting with one another in the economy were strangers to one another. And if that were the case, then it might be true that in order to reduce transaction costs, that when transactions got complicated, you, they would always have to be internalized into firms. But in fact, when you look at real markets, you see s small independent firms carrying on very complicated transactions with one another. Uh, Silicon Valley, for example, or many high-tech regions uh, are examples of that, or, or the so-called Third Italy, where these textile firms carry out very complicated relationships with, with one another. Uh, and okay, let me interrupt him here, because uh, he keeps going on here. Um, but um, it's, so it makes a lot of sense, you know, that kind of our, our I don't know, business relations or economic life, you know, that sort of relationships actually matter. I mean, even just in your daily life, just think about it. Just this weekend, I was with a friend in, a, in this uh, coffee place, you know, we just had some coffee. As it turns out, the barista is a former intern of my friend, yeah, uh, which meant we got free brownies, yeah, which was nice. Yeah. But there you see actually how you have, like, even on a daily life, you know, you eat, because you're likely to, to be at certain places where other people are. You know, it's like how our life is. You're likely to meet the same people, again, you know, when you go to the same coffee shop in Hawaii. So you're also more likely to establish relationships with them. So now let me kind of uh, move over to social networks a little bit. We talked about this embeddedness in a very general term right now. And people had some trouble with, okay, how do we actually, actually operationalize that? This embeddedness paper is a little, little vague. You know, we all have, we have an idea now. We have like the idea of what Granovit has said about embeddedness, but I don't know what does it actually mean at the end of the day, right? Or how can we how can we in detail look at that? And this is now where social network analysis comes into play. And this is what I do in my in my daily life. So actually, just just before I came here, I was working on a paper with a student who kind of collected data on forest owners in Ireland and how they ask each other for help. I don't know and knowledge transfer. I know she's doing a PhD in forestry, but you know it's methodologically interesting for me. And uh, at the end of the day, it is about relational data. It's about something like this, yeah? where this could be doesn't this don't have to be people. Could be other things. Could be organizations, right? That are related with each other somehow. But you know, most of our life, the thing that we are interested in is actually there are people that are related with each other somehow. And these relationships can take very different, very different forms, right? I have some examples for that. So a social network is really just a structure like that, you know, made of a set of actors. We call them actors or nodes or whatnot, uh, and and sort of a set of ties or dyadic relationships or edges or arcs, and different names for the same thing. It's really just about individuals. Think about it like that: individuals and some sort of relation between them. And these two things together, they kind of make these cool little graphs, or they make up uh, relational data. You know, and I happen to study, for example, this. Um, there would be, would we did be, this is a, this is a youth gang in London. It's a youth gang in London where a friend of mine got embedded, actually, for two years. He was running with that youth gang in East London. And um, at the end, we kind of mapped out the relationships within this gang with the help of CCTV cameras and police officers, and actually the police had an undercover agent in that gang, so it's actually like crazy stuff, you know. If you want to know more about it, my uh, friend James, he wrote a book, How Gangs Work, nice book. Uh, this is just a little offspring of that, where I got into, uh, um, uh, came in, because we, we, we looked at ethnicity within this gang. So this is one youth gang. In fact, it's, all, it's an old black youth gang, and historically people just thought this is the black youth gang, this is the... I don't know, the Hispanic gang and so on. And we were interested in are there sort of ethnic differences within that gang, right? And we looked at the kind of stuff that people do, yeah, kind of crimes they commit, are they involved in drug deals and 
sell uh, sales of weapons and burglaries or whatnot. Turns out ethnicity didn't matter for that at all. But when you look at the graph, this is a co-offending graph, ethnicity mattered greatly for with whom they did it. So it didn't matter for what they did, but it mattered for with whom they did it. Right? Because now you see there are more sort of relationships between two nodes of the same color. Right? That's a phenomenon we call homophily. And essentially, this is like what these two papers are about. Um, I was saying that I did some serious work on, on football. You know, actually, I did. So I looked at uh, over 800 of these networks uh, representing the patterns of interactions in, uh, in, in Premier League football teams in, in matches. And I related that to the performance of the team at the end of the day. Very simple question I asked, is it more beneficial to have a superstar where everything goes through? Or should you play in a more decentralized way? Anybody an idea? Well, I did a lot of fancy cross-random effects puzzle modeling to come up with what probably all of you would have thought, that it's better when you are a good team that plays in a decentralized way. So, but I showed it with a lot of data, you know, and I don't know, theoretically uh, grounded on this idea that, you know, then you have different opportunities around it and so on. But anyway, so that's sort of like a kind of network that I looked at. I think the last time I mentioned the paper that we uh, just published uh, this year is on, uh, on the flow of uh, people from different parts of Stockholm to other parts. It's now a migration flow. There you see a map of Stockholm, and you see people moving, moving around. Uh, it's just, I don't know, an indicator of how, how, how many people go from one neighborhood to the other. Another paper that I'm currently working on, uh, there you see something evolving, actually. So I also look at the evolution of networks. Why? Because it's actually really interesting. Time is always your best friend when you want to get to the, co to the cause of things, because it allows you to find out what was first and what came after. In a while, you can you can dig down to the mechanism. This is a network of a corruption scandal. So now what you see is actually individuals pointing fingers at each other and denouncing each other. So this is now a negative tie. You know, these are all people that were involved somehow in a corruption scandal, and they were asked to testify in front of a tribunal after the whole scandal broke. It was like this I don't know it's government spending scandal, and then they all came in and one after the other they started to falter and they started to, started to denounce others. And the coolest thing about this is that this all happened in public. So it was all broadcasted on television, live television. It's so like the big event in Quebec. This is like in Quebec, a big uh, government center in, in Canada. And, um, and the key here is that people watch TV and they kind of realized, I don't know, a person denounced me, so that actually it made me more likely to denounce that person back. An eye for an eye. Or there's another mechanism about, I don't know, scapegoating or punishing those who talk. Actually, I might talk more about that next week. But uh, that's another example of uh, network analysis that I, that I did. So, um, you know, network analysis by itself is like a huge area. You know, there's so many different things you can do. It's like more like a toolbox. There's not just one way of doing network analysis. You can statistically model things, but you can also just describe things. You can try to find patterns in it. Uh, blocks, cliques, or whatnot, or you can visualize it. So there's an awful amount of things that you can do. Yeah? But at the end, for us, the important point is, okay, networks are sort of a way of capturing this idea of embeddedness, this idea of how we are connected to other people and how that ultimately affects what we do. Right? And just in the previous paper, you know, the fact that, I don't know, how other people, what other people said in front of that tribunal really affected what I said in front of the tribunal and so on. Finally, the uncle of one of my co-authors was also in that tribunal. He was involved in this corruption scandal, which involved the Italian mafia in Montreal. Anyway, um, so let's move on. And now let's talk about the strength of weak ties. Uh, that's sort of like another thing where now this sort of is being applied a little bit. And uh, it is like this second most famous paper of Mark Granovetter. It's a simple idea, uh, simple idea, but also it shows you like how networks matter or how different kinds of network types or relationships might matter differently. So, you know, Granovetter is like this, I don't know, is the second most cited paper of him. Uh, and uh, he basically started his PhD thesis. In his PhD thesis, he was curious about how people find jobs. A very simple question. How do you find a job? And he kept getting the same answer, that it was through an acquaintance, not a friend. Got a job through an acquaintance, not a friend. Why not through a friend? Why through this weird acquaintance? 
why it through this guy that you somehow know a little bit, yeah, but not really. Yeah. As it turns out, most people get jobs through acquaintances like that. So it's really those, those kind of connections at the fringe that you make that actually are really important. Yeah. And maybe you see where I'm going with this, because the people that are really close to you, they don't tell you anything new. While the people at the fringe, they have access to completely different parts of the network that you would not have had access to begin with. Oh, yeah. That's true, yeah. 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 yeah, that's a, that's another point. Yeah. Do you really want to recommend, I don't know, this job and kind of push hard because if it doesn't work out, you know, it falls back on you. Yeah. So uh, so that's uh, that's the thing. So he was sort of interested in how people get jobs, and you know, the argument that I was making earlier about this structural component, you know, now we kind of go a little bit in that direction, but don't freak out about it. You see like a little network here, it's like a little little example. And you know now we have like this link between A and B, and actually that's what we call in the literature a bridge. It's called a bridge as a definition of what is a bridge. Yeah, and maybe you see already why this is a bridge. Yeah, well, it's bridging these different parts together. If if I would take that thing out, the network would fall apart into two pieces. So that connection here is really crucial to get information from the one part of the network to the other part of the network. As it turns out, this is how a bridge is defined. A bridge is defined as the removal of that partitions the network. Then actually we can also have something like a local bridge, uh, where it doesn't completely make it fall apart, but actually makes it significantly harder to get information from here to there. If you take out the orange line, then you have to suddenly make all the way around to pass that word about that job. Right? Okay. So bridges, they allow the diffusion of information between otherwise disconnected communities, you know, because this is sort of how they are defined, you know, and local bridges bring otherwise distant communities together. It's like, almost like a shortcut a little bit. You know, there's a little world, there's a little world, and there's this one connection that kind of brings these two communities together. Okay, so now we need to think about one more piece in order to put it all together. We can think about the strength of ties. And a tie or you know, a relationship can be strong or it can be weak. It can be a really good friend of yours, or it can be this acquaintance. The one is called strong, the other one is called weak. And Granovetter, actually, this is now a copy from his paper, you know, he kind of says, okay, well, it's related to the strength of a tie is probably a linear combination of the amount of time, the emotional intensity, the intimacy, mutual confining, and the reciprocal services which characterize the tie. So, I don't know, your good friends you spend time with, you tell them your inner secrets, you kind of, I don't know, uh, help each other if needs be. That kind of defines a strong relationship. Yeah. While with the weak tie, you do not necessarily spend that much time together and so on. Right? So these are the different, uh, the different things about how we can have ties that are strong and weak. Okay, and now the, the last piece of the puzzle, which is, which is the last piece of the puzzle, which is this idea Think about this scenario on the left, where you have really good friends, you're A and you have a really good friend B, and you have a really good friend C. It's kind of awkward that those guys don't know each other. Actually, even when you think about, I don't know, going out and spending time in the bars, you have a limited amount of time. I don't know, you, you, spending time with that person also means less time spending with that other person if they don't want to spend time with each other. So actually, it's very likely that at some point they get to, get to know each other. Yeah? You say, ah, come along, you know, I'm meeting this other guy already. Yeah. And then you're sitting in the pub, and then you kind of have these, what we call, triadic closure. It's like one of those universal patterns in network analysis. We see much more triads than we would expect to find by chance. It's just a normal human thing. It happens to be that your friends are often friends amongst each other. Right? Sometimes you bring them together. Sometimes you are there because they are both friends to begin with already. Yeah. So friends introduce each other, you know, we spend time with each other, we have limited resources and so on, and all leads to this idea, and that's like one of the most universal patterns in social network analysis, that we have this tendency for those patterns to turn into those patterns. Triads have a tendency to, unclosed triads have a tendency to close, especially when there are these strong links connected with each other, right? Because you spend a lot of time with them. So that's a phenomena that we observe. And when you kind of put these two things together now that you have strong ties and that strong open triads kind of tend to close, right? While weak ties, do not, you don't spend that much time with them to begin with. So why would you have the tendency for that tie to close? And that's the argument 
that uh, when, when it is the case that strong ties make triad closure more likely, then non-closed triads are more likely to involve weak ties. So if you are in this situation where you know one person very well and, I don't know, and another person and they are not connected with each other, chances are that one of the persons that you're connected with is actually not that much of a close friend. Because yeah? when they are both very close friends, actually chances are much higher that they are connected amongst each other. Okay, so that's actually the argument in the strength of the ties paper because that then leads to the phenomena that when we kind of have that thing that triads are more likely to close when there are kind of strong relationships involved and that then these unclosed triads are more likely to involve those weak links that we have there, as you see here, then it turns out that bridges are more likely to be weak ties. So those ties that connect otherwise disconnected components with each other they are more likely to be these acquaintances-shaped relationships, or these very weak relationships, yeah? not really close friends. Because if they would be really close friends, they wouldn't, survive, they, they wouldn't be a bridge. Yeah? Because then there would be yet another third person, I don't know, or you or all being friends with each other as well. And then it's not a bridge anymore. Then it's not that crucial component anymore. So there you see, now we have this weird thing where those ties that admittedly are important, you know, these bridges, they kind of hold things together. They kind of transmit information from one part to the other part. Now we are in this situation where these kind of relationships actually are more likely to be these weak ties. These weak relationships that connect to a distant part of the world where there's another connection over there and people know each other. So Granovetter then argues that uh, under, under many circumstances, strong ties are actually less useful than weak ties. Why would weak ties? Why would strong ties be less useful than than, than weak ties? Well, he says like these strong ties, you know, they do not provide access to something new. There's this whole other guy, Ron Bird. He wrote about brokerage and closure and so on. He I don't know, made his career on that. Um, the, the whole idea is that. If you have a strong tie to somebody who is by definition more likely to be, I don't know, a friend of a friend already anyway, that what you hear from that person is less likely to be something new. You already, you have so many other opportunities to have heard exactly the same information from the other people that are also connected to that guy who then heard it from that person. So that's the idea. While in contrast, weak ties give access to people we do not have already access to anyway. So as it turns out, the most successful people, or in, I don't know, in some contexts it's different, yeah, but let's say finding a job, are the ones that have these random connections to really distinct groups of people. Why? Because they kind of hear from within those distant groups, you know, they have knowledge about, hey, we have a new job, I don't know, and, and then that information spills out to them. And they also get information from another component that spills out to them. So they get access to more information. Of course, then you can also argue, you know, okay, well, maybe these strong ties are more likely to talk about it to begin with. You know, maybe there's a higher frequency of interaction. And then we are at the trade off band, uh, the, 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 the bandwidth trade off. There's another paper by Sinan Aral, a guy at MIT, who wrote a paper in AJS, I think, two, three years ago, where he discusses that. And basically, he takes ground away one step further, thinking about, okay, there's also a frequency of contact. You know, if there's a weak tie, I don't call that guy very often, right? So there's also less opportunities for that guy to tell me something. Even though it might be more likely to be new, it's less likely to happen in a way. Right? But that's like another step. You know, that's like the next thing where people took that further and a lot of people I don't know, thought about uh, this weak ties idea. So to sum this up. So we are embedded in social networks and draw information and knowledge from, from them. You know, hence not just our own position in the network matters, but also the position of the other people we are connected with. So you see, this is kind of weird. So it's not just the friends that I have. I just showed you that actually it really matters like how my friends are connected to other people. That matters for me at the end of the day. So I could have exactly, we could have exactly the same situation we have exactly the same friend, I don't know, or I don't know, the same situations where I have like five friends, you have five friends, but somehow your friends are just so much more useful than mine. Because they are sort of like distinct part. While my friends, they all know each other, they all tell me the same. <coughs> So uh, weak ties are those with people we are socially distant to us, but they bring us knowledge that we would not have had otherwise, that is not available 
directly to us. So many weak ties, more access to wider communities, ideas, resources. Yeah. And then Ron Bird, he thought, thought that further. Mm. And uh, uh, let, me, let me just, I want to get to the next one. Uh, that's just what I said, you know, there could be this trade-off, you know, that strong connections actually talk more about it in a way, while, while weak ties actually are less likely to overlap with information um, that we would have already had. But I want to, you guys to listen to the man himself again. So now this is Grant, Mark Granovader talking about the strength of weak ties. People think social networks is a new idea, a new thing to study. And in fact, anthropologists started talking about social networks probably in the 1930s. And mathematicians were talking about them in the 1950s. Uh, and sociologists started picking up on social networks in the 1960s. So I wanted to do a dissertation that showed how interesting and important social networks were. It seemed to me that one of the biggest sources of inequality in our society, in, in almost any modern industrial society, is differences in the rewards to different jobs people have. So if you could show that people found their jobs through social networks, then that would mean that social networks were a big part of where inequality is coming from. And instead of studying, as I wanted to, men and women and blue-collar and white-collar workers, I only studied male professional, technical, and managerial workers because that was manageable and it was already um, as many people as I could possibly handle. Professional, te technical, and managerial workers are what we might call higher white-collar workers. Doctors and lawyers and teachers and professors uh, and managers and engineers and scientists and people who do technical work. So I found directories for the, for the city of Newton. Uh, and from these directories, I chose a sample of people who had recently changed from one job to another. Almost every single person either let me into their house and was interviewed right on the spot or uh, said, well, you know, we're in the middle of dinner or something, but come back on Saturday. So I ended up with 100 people who fit the sample criteria that they'd ch changed jobs recently. And then once I had interviewed those people and had some sense of what was going on, then I could write a survey instrument that I mailed out to another couple of hundred people, and I got 182 of those back. A lot of times when people would tell me that they found their job through someone they knew, I would say to them, oh, so you found the job through a friend. And over and over again, people would correct me and say, no, 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 not a friend, just an acquaintance, just an acquaintance. When you hang around with your best friends, they tend to know each other, and you form a clique with them, uh, and their best friends are kind of the same as your best friends. So if you want new information, if you want to be clued in on the latest styles or trends or information, uh, then you ought to go to your weak ties, your seventh and eighth best friends. They're in different circles from your circle and they connect you to, the, to those other circles. In a, in a sense, they are your windows on the world. Most of the people who changed jobs in my study were changing them voluntarily. So that almost never happens unless people think the new job is a better job. So if they really wanted information about new jobs, about jobs they weren't going to hear about any other way, they were finding it through acquaintances and not through their close friends. The majority of these workers had found their jobs through personal contacts. It was 56 percent. And what was really interesting to me was that more than three quarters, just a bit more than 75 percent of those in the highest income categories had found their jobs through personal contacts. So this effect was much stronger among people who were at the top of the stratification hierarchy. So this meant to me that social networks were particularly important in channeling people into the best jobs that the economy had to offer. It turned out that people who had been in one job for a very long time, in a place where other people had been in a job for a very long time, had a lot of trouble changing jobs when they had to, because they just didn't know people in other companies. People, on the other hand, at, at, at the bottom end, who would change their job every few months, uh, they weren't in those jobs long enough to really make contacts that mattered. The people whose average job tenures was two to five years were more likely to find new jobs through weak ties than people whose, whose average job tenure was very long or very short. Okay, let me stop the, stop the man here. You can read more on this paper, The Strength of Weak Ties, and I'm going to put it in the uh, further reading list. Uh, until Thursday, there's a pretty cool reading, Why Your Friends Have More Friends Than You Have. Actually, I can tell you it's true. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, I will show you that your friends even tend to look better than you.